Hello everyone! In this video I'm going to go over two common myths in dog training on the topics of teaching a puppy not to bite as well as teaching a puppy to be safe and calm and confident when being restrained such as for a veterinary visit or when an owner needs to hold, hold their dog or pick the dog up. So the first one, teaching a puppy not to bite I have to first say that um, there are many different ways of training dogs and in this video I'm just talking about the fact that there are different ways that work. So when I first got into dog training I learned Ian Dunbar's method and I love Ian Dunbar. I think he did amazing, uh, you know, he's changed the world of dog training for the better and his technique of teaching a puppy not to bite, bite works because I've used it and it works really well. However, I do use a different method because um, for some clients I feel like they, they don't succeed as well, my own clients, uh, with, with, um, with the process of teaching a, bu a puppy to bite you and then bite you softer and softer until they bite you no more. Uh, that's very, very basically said. Uh, so you're teaching the puppy bite inhibition, but also teaching the puppy not to bite. So that technique works. I'm not saying that it doesn't, and I'm not saying that it's a lesser technique. I love Ian Dunbar. What I am saying is there is another method that is, that is functional and I'm going to talk about it very briefly. But uh, so this isn't, this video is not being negative about other techniques. It's about saying there are, there are options and I'm going to talk about uh, why I train uh, no biting using this other method. Um, firstly, I would say uh, there's some breeds like uh, Huskies, um, and maybe German Shepherds, I don't want to be labeling breeds, but there's some breeds or puppies with a specific personality where they're very mouthy. And so um, what can happen if you let the puppy practice or rehearse a behavior, even if they don't get any rein reinforcement history from it, there's still a memory that's created between seeing a hand and biting it. So um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a rehearsal history where the puppy has rehearsed the behaviors. So for me, I like to make it so that there's, uh, you know, errorless learning where there's no rehearsal history of the puppy mouthing your hands and feet. So you're going to do that by um, using management and prevention. If you know when your puppy's going to bite you, you prevent those situations from occurring while you train the puppy that the stimulus of your hands moving or touching them means some other behavior besides biting. So you can do that in small approximations and uh, arranging the antecedents so that um, you're setting the puppy up for success. So they're learning what behaviors you do want them to do rather than them rehearsing them and then learning not to. So in terms of teaching bite inhibition, I really suggest training your puppy every day using a variety of different value reinforcers. So low value kibble, um, and if your puppy's really excited about food, then slowly integrating different levels of reinforcement, uh, like high value food, like freshly cooked steak or something like that. And the way that you're gonna teach your puppy to have a soft mouth is by feeding them treats during training when they're first very calm, but also very excited. So they're learning that even though they're very excited about playing with a toy, when they go to put their mouth on you, they can take the treat softly. So that's how I train it with, um, with human interactions, but also by letting the puppy interact and play with appropriate dogs, not puppies and adult dogs that play rough, but puppies and adult dogs that are going to tell the puppy that they're, they're being hurt by the puppy if the puppy bites hard, but also by um, interacting softly and calmly and playing appropriately so that puppy's really learning um, how to interact with other dogs with their mouth without uh, biting them super hard. So that's my technique uh, that I use for, for working on teaching puppies to not bite your hands and um, and also bite inhibition. So if they were to bite, they're gonna bite super soft. So I do have a terrier, Mr. Tug, and he has bitten me. Um, I have to admit that uh, he, ha he had terrible back pain. And as I was going down, feeling his back to see where it hurt, he turned around and bit my hand, but 
There was no mark on my hand. It didn't even hurt. Um, so that's what we're looking for in dogs. Uh, we want dogs that tell us when they're feeling bad by growling. And if they were to suddenly feel extreme pain, um, that if they go to bite, it's, you know, an inhibited bite. And then what you have there is a dog that communicates and a safe dog uh, when, they, when they are, they're scared or in pain. Another really important thing is, of course, building a trusting relationship with your dog and exposing them, you know, socialization and all that stuff also helps. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a video uh, of how to train your dog not to bite your hands at the end of this, of this video so you can watch the tutorial. I just want to reiterate that this video is not saying that one method is better than the other. Um, what I am saying is that there are different ways of training this. For example, uh, when I've gone to help other trainers and they've learned Ian Dunbar's bite inhibition protocol, um, they're very scared to try something new because they think that if they don't follow the protocol exactly, step by step, um, that they're going to have a dog that if you slam their tail uh, in a car door, they're going to turn around and take your leg off. So um, that's why I'm making this video, is that there are different uh, there are different ways of training things and you can achieve the same result. The only reason that I train this other way is that I found with my own private clients and helping other people and my own dogs that uh, to really get reliably the dog not biting the hand or offering biting the hand when they're excited it, um, by using errorless learning where they're, they're never rehearsing or rehearsing the biting the hands less, um, that really, really uh, speeds up the process and makes the dog less likely to have um, pr practice rehearsing the behavior. So when with either technique or any technique, if the client's not using management or prevention, that's also going to completely ruin the training. So they, you know, let the puppy out of the crate and the puppy immediately starts biting their legs and they don't see that pattern um, that it's every time they open the crate is the cue to bite your legs and then they stop the puppy biting in whatever way, positive reinforcement or punishment, whatever, they've rehearsed biting the legs. So the number one reason that, um, in my opinion, that a puppy might continually bite is one, it's their personality uh, and genetics, uh, but, and, and, and playing rough with litter mates or, or the breeder for eight weeks before you get them. But also the, the number one reason that clients do is that they're not using management and prevention and not uh, writing down all the times with a piece of paper and a pen, the family writing down when the puppy tends to bite and preventing and managing that from happening while they train the puppy uh, what they do want the puppy to do um, in these different situations. The second myth in dog training that I want to talk about is teaching a dog to be safe and comfortable when you restrain them uh, or prevent them from doing something they want to do. So um, when I first got into dog training, both techniques uh, that were very common were uh, the, the, the way that I trained no biting and also for training a restraint, what you would do is you hold the dog, this was 16 years ago, you hold the dog the puppy and they struggle and struggle and struggle and then when they finally give up then you let them go or they feel they they relax you let them go their body relaxes now uh, the problem with that um, is that it is it can be based on extinction and extinction can be very stressful and you have to do it again and again and generalize it and um, there are ways uh, and trainers who can break up this process so that it's not a stressful experience for the puppy. Um, so every, every, every training situation is, is subjective. So imagine uh, there's a fearful puppy in a puppy class, the trainer picks up the puppy, the puppy's terrified, they hold on to the puppy, the puppy thinks they're gonna die and they defecate on the trainer and, and they're just traumatized by the event because they're being restrained uh, and they, they weren't ready for that step yet. Where uh, there's a puppy laying on the couch and they're all sleepy and then the, you know, the owner holds the puppy for a little bit and then lets the puppy go before they even think to struggle and then they build on it. So there's nothing wrong with the technique of, of restraining a puppy and then letting them go. 
uh, if it, the important thing is that you really have to read the dog's body language and you really have to be an expert in what you're doing with your hands and knowing what intimidates dogs um, and if the dog is being intimidated by you. Because if you don't, it can quickly be a slippery slope into something that the dog is going to start to have an aversion to being held. So maybe if they are held, they're going to be like, oh, I just have to do nothing and then I get let go. Or they learn um, to avoid the situation completely. So you might not be able to pick the dog up again. Or when you go to you know, restrain the dog or put on their leash, they run away. Um, there are all these side effects that can happen uh, because of the fact that there was some part of this behavior of the extinction process was not enjoyable for the dog. So um, I suggest instead of doing that technique, if you have a, um, a, well, for me, it's like I want to choose a technique that is the safest and most likely for errors not to happen. So there will be errors, but the, by breaking the steps up small enough, again, small approximations and arranging the environment, really setting the puppy up for success that they're going to see the stimulus or feel the stimulus, that situation happens and it happens in a way that they feel good and they do the right behavior. So that's the two things you're looking for. Classical conditioning, you're conditioning a positive emotional response where the dog's like, this feels good, I feel safe. And you're also teaching them what to do. Oh, we're being restrained, I need to be still and relax. So um, you, the same with any technique you use, if you're going to suddenly begin training in a situation where your dog is very aroused and excited, you're not going to have the success as training the puppy or dog when they're comfortable and in a, a non-distracting environment where the food is reinforcing to them uh, and you're going to uh, break the steps up small enough. So I'm going to attach the video of how I train this technique at the end of this video. So I'll have the two tutorials the one on how to teach your puppy not to bite, and then the restraint. And these are so important for puppies. So uh, to begin with, to teach a restraint where the puppy is, you know, for someone who has no experience in dog training, no experience in reading a dog, um, having the puppy go between your legs and just putting your hands on the puppy's chest. That's a wonderful first start to teaching a restraint. Um, of course, if your puppy's sleeping next to you and they are enjoying handling, you can pet your puppy. But if there's food around, you're really going to condition the handling and the no biting exercises and the restraint um, using positive reinforcement. So it's very obvious when you're using the food, if your puppy's like, ah, I don't want to do that because they start to struggle, and you can just let them go and then work in small approximations of reinforcing that behavior of really wanting to be restrained and then start to add um, distractions that are exciting um, in a way that the dog can uh, deal with it. So again, I want to reiterate that this video is about pointing out that there are different ways of training and that I'm not saying that one method is better than the other. I'm simply saying why I specifically choose this method than the more commonly used method uh, done by dog trainers. And um, for me, what I found is that uh, it can go well or it can go really badly. So for example, a dog could learn to be very confident, confident and comfortable being held, or that example of the puppy class where the dog defecates themselves and has like a really traumatic experience, or perhaps it's the first time that they've practiced aggression. So you hold the puppy and the puppy doesn't give up and you have a puppy with that sort of personality and they start to become very, very aggressive and start, um, biting your arms like aggressively and then what you're having to do is work you know work on aggression issues now using extinction which uh for um a new owner i really don't think they should be doing that as the first things that they do with their puppy i think that, that by, by going step by step and if the puppy has this personality that um they address that in small steps rather than jumping right into making the puppy as aggressive and, and fearful as they've ever been in their life and then trying to use extinction uh, to work on that. Restraint training.
In this tutorial, I'm going to show you how I do a puppy restraint. Now, it's very important that you don't do this with an adult dog, especially a dog that's scared or aggressive, because you could go too fast, too quickly, and there is the potential for scaring the dog or making the dog bite you. So, it's really important to teach the puppy to be restrained, because as an adult, if the dog has to go to the vet and needs to be restrained for shots or has an injury, and you know you have to restrain your dog while they're getting medical care, uh, it's really important that the dog finds it calm and relaxing rather than very scary in the moment that he needs to be restrained. So the way that I like to teach this behavior is in small steps, small successful steps, so you're not scaring the puppy any time along the way. Step one, build calm confidence when touched on different parts of the body. First you're just working on touching your puppy, yeah, and using a calm marker and calm treat delivery. So what do I mean by that? Well, you're bringing the treats to the puppy very slowly, and you want to also start training when the puppy's sleepy and not very excited, yeah. So you touch the puppy, yeah, and then you give the puppy a treat. Awesome. Yep. Good job. Okay. So you want to do it when your puppy's laying down, but also standing up. Because what can happen is if they're standing up and you reach and try to touch your puppy, and they back away, get it. Yep. And you know you're going too far too quickly. Make the game easier if your puppy gets overexcited, mouths your hand, or backs away. Yep. If you have a shy puppy, check out my video handling shyness, and if you have a mouthy puppy, check out my video on how to stop your puppy mouthing and biting. Move on to step two once your puppy is comfortable with being touched. Step two, restrain and reinforce. I like to lure the puppy between my legs and then put my hand against the puppy's chest. Mark and feed. This way, if your puppy doesn't like your hand on his chest, he can back up. Once it's successful, you can sit down and restrain your puppy. In the beginning, you want to use a high rate of reinforcement, so you mark and feed immediately as you begin restraining your puppy, and every few seconds. Don't mark if your puppy starts whining or struggling. Instead, walk away from your puppy and see if your puppy wants to join you. Then work on the exercise in step one. Step three, increase duration and use calm massage. Increase the amount of time between when you mark and feed. You can use calm massage as well as breathing deeply and sighing to help calm your puppy down. Step four, vary how you restrain the puppy. You want to vary the restraint. So restrain your dog in a sit, restrain your dog while standing, Restrain your dog while you're cradling him, and see if you can restrain your dog upside down. Most dogs hate being upside down, but it's necessary for them to be restrained upside down in certain circumstances, at the vet, for example, and for grooming, it's really nice if your dog is comfortable upside down, so you can see what's going on on the underside of them. I'm gonna lift her up, yep, and mark as I lift, and then feed. Now, if she finds it very aversive, I can simply start just squeezing her, yeah, while her feet are still on the ground. Yep. Good. Yep. Well done. Yep. Yep. Good job. Yeah. So when I laid her like this, she didn't like it at all. 
I'm just going to let her get up. If at any point your puppy panics or gets overexcited, I suggest taking it back a step to just touching, yep, and feeding so your dog is confident and happy to have your hands on him. Step five, add distractions. Once your puppy is really relaxed and calm with being restrained, when there are no distractions, you can start to add distractions. So for example, um, if you were in the park and you were holding your puppy and you saw a squirrel or another dog, he might want to escape you and run towards the dog and that would make him frustrated. So I'm going to put a little distraction of treats down here, yep, and then I'm going to say yep, and feed my dog for understanding the concept of yep, you can't get those treats right now because I'm holding you. Now if your puppy struggles and squirms, you can put the treats further away or use a distraction that's less exciting. So maybe there's some kibble far away and you're feeding your dog hot dogs or cheese. Yep, for having the impulse control to not just squirm to go and get what he wants. So this is a great exercise for dogs that are impulsive and they can't control their impulses. The idea is that you want your dog to understand that the best place to be is here, being restrained with you. Yep. Ready? Okay. And then you can release your dog to go and get the treats. Go get him. Go in. Yeah, right there. Step six, add grooming and handling. First, handle and groom your puppy in the way you will when he's restrained. If he doesn't like it when he's loose and backs away, then don't move on to restraining him and doing the same exercises. It may take many training sessions to get to this point. This golden doodle puppy used to be very mouthy and bitey when restrained until the family members worked hard on handling and restraint and you can see their efforts have paid off. Restraint training in a real time training session. So the other game that I wanted to play with him is the restraint. Um, so uh, most trainers, uh, well, I don't know anymore, but when I started training, everybody did the restraint where you hold the dog like this. This was like 18 years ago, but I still see people doing this. Uh, so basically what you do is you hold the dog and then they struggle and struggle. And then what they learn is by stopping struggling uh, and, and just giving up that's when you let them go. So that's based on something called extinction, where the dog tries what they usually do, and then um, when they fail, uh, and they, tr they try so hard and it never works, then they learn that the only way to uh, get out of the grip is to uh, just give up. So the problem with using extinction is that what can happen is the behavior can get more intense. So if your puppy was whining and barking, they might start screaming. If your puppy was mouthing you, they might start biting you harder and harder before they give up. And then also it, it, extinction, it doesn't just uh, fix the problem. Uh, the puppy needs or the adult dog would need to have multiple sessions to generalize. And like any type of behavior, um, what can happen is the behaviors can come back. So not only is the mouthing and biting part going to come back, but the more intense behaviors could come back too, like the screaming and the biting your arms harder than, than they thought to do before. So I like to use an errorless learning type approach where you're just reinforcing the puppy for being restrained like this. And we've already worked on this and he's very comfortable with handling. So uh, I have a video on this and one of the techniques to begin with is simply lowering the puppy between your legs like this. Ooh, so that you don't have to manhandle them like I did earlier. He really likes these treats. I should have used uh, less exciting treats, but that's okay. There we go. And then sitting down like this. So if at any time the puppy wants to leave and they've had enough, you just let go and they come out. But the only way to get the treats is to do the restraint exercise. So um, I'm going to lure him through here just so viewers don't manhandle their puppy to begin with so i've got him sitting like that 
And then I'm going to put my hand on his chest and feed him treats like this. Good. Good. And I can calmly pet him. And this is going to help calm your dog down and also help if your dog gets overexcited out and about, this is going to help calm them down. Where if you didn't work on this uh, and then you try to restrain your dog out and about, what can happen is that they can get over overexcited by this restraint. Good. Good job. You're so good. I also like to use a calm marker working on this exercise uh, along with other calm behaviors. Good. So my calm marker, marker is good like that. And you can see that he, he's heard that a few times already. Good. And you can get eye contact from your puppy if you wanted as well. I don't particularly want him looking at where the treats went. And you can see he's really comfortable with me restraining him like this. Then the thing that we're going to work on in this training session, now that we did a little warm up, is putting something out of reach. So I put a treat there. Good. And I can mark him. Good. Before he struggles to try and get the treat. Good. And then I can release him to it. Okay, go get it. And that is going to help, say for example, your puppy or your adult dog wants to meet someone or do something and you prevent them from doing it by holding them, picking them up or restraining them if they're a larger dog. Um, and that's going to be so helpful because they won't feel, uh, it's an impulse control exercise, so they won't feel like, oh my gosh, I'm being punished uh, because I can't get to what I want to. And this human being <laughs> is just depriving me of all the good stuff in life. So basically you're teaching them, good, that even though they're being held like this, it's in their best interest. Awesome. And you're conditioning that positive emotional response to being restrained rather than it being a frustrating thing. It's a calming thing. Okay, go get it. Good job. And I haven't worked on leave it with him. So um, what was happening there is I was reinforcing the absence of his choice to go toward the treat before he thought to go to, towards the treat. So as I put the treat down, I fed him and then fed him at a high rate of reinforcement. And what that caused him to do was when I released him to the treat, he didn't actually want to go to get it, which is great because what happens when you play games like this is that you reduce the dog's arousal and interest in going towards things uh, that they're excited about. Good. So for example, if you were doing this game with other dogs uh, where your dog wanted to play with another puppy, you're going to reduce that excitement about getting to whatever it is. Good job. Okay, go get it. See how he's just sitting there? Get it. There we go. Awesome. Okay, and we'll stop there. And so that's enough for uh, one training session. Solving puppy biting. This video is about solving and managing puppy mouthing and biting, as well as teaching the puppy to be calm, confident, and relaxed when handled. Because most puppies, when you reach for them, and pet them excitedly or even just pet them calmly, it can make the puppy aroused and also want to mouth at your hands or your clothes. Now, puppies are very similar to human toddlers in that they're exploring the world using their mouth. Now, most toddlers use their hands, but they also will put things into their mouths. And when a puppy sees things, they're naturally going to want to try putting that thing into their mouth. So if you reach for your puppy and you're touching your puppy, the puppy wants to naturally do the same back to you, but they're going to be using their mouth. So we need to train the puppies that when we reach and touch them, it's not a game of mouthing. It's simply that we're petting the dog in order to calm them down or just interact with them in a calm manner. If your puppy started to bite at your hands like this, I suggest getting your puppy's attention, pop, 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 and then say, oh my goodness, look, what is that? and point out a toy that already exists in the environment. So don't get a toy out of a new place, like on top of a, a counter and give your puppy a toy, because they could quickly learn they can get your attention by biting you to get access to toys they don't have. But I suggest having some cool toys around that you interact with often that the puppy likes, and then get your puppy to play with those toys and interact with those toys 
when he's feeling like checking things out in the environment with his mouth or chewing on wow. things. When you first bring your puppy home, you want to really create a reinforcement history for playing with his toys right from the start. Don't just leave the toys out and hope he'll choose those over your socks and shoes, or better yet, pick up your socks and shoes so your puppy is more likely to spend the day playing with his toys that you want him to play with rather than your stuff, or your clothes, your hair, and your hands. So as you can see, this pup really enjoys playing with his toys. Managing and preventing mouthing and biting. Pet and handle your puppy calmly and gently. Instead of petting your puppy excitedly, play with a toy with your puppy. Write a list of the times your puppy bites and avoid putting your puppy in those situations unless you plan to train your puppy. If your puppy becomes overexcited and mouthy, you can put him in his pen where he can play with his toys. We can teach puppies what to do when being petted, handled, and groomed by setting up short training sessions. You can use a portion of your puppy's breakfast and dinner to work on handling exercises, and I suggest working on them daily when you first get your puppy. Step one, touch and feed a treat at the same time. The reason that you want to feed and touch at the same time is that if you have a mouthy puppy and you just reach for your puppy, your puppy might either lick or bite at your hand as you're reaching for your puppy, or if you have a timid puppy, you reach for your puppy and your puppy might back away, and that's not the first thing you want your puppy to do when you reach for them in a training session. So I suggest starting out every training session by feeding and touching at the same time. So if you're going to be touching your puppy's feet, you touch and feed at the same time, practice touching the top of the head, and you're doing this all calmly so the puppy isn't finding it overwhelming at first. So now I'm touching on the back of his shoulders like this and feeding. And then once you've done that and your puppy is seeming pretty contented to get his treat while you touch him at the same time, you can move on to the next step, which is making the petting the predictor of food. Because at the first step, you're simply teaching him what's going to happen to him while he's not doing anything. And then the second step is teaching him that the actual petting is what predicts that the food is going to come. Step two, touch your puppy, say good or click, and then move to feed a treat. So I'm going to touch him, say good, and then give him a treat. Good. 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 Once your puppy is calm and relaxed with you placing your hand on your puppy, you can also practice Good. stroking gestures. It's right there. Good. Good. Step three, add duration to the handling and teach the puppy to ignore the treats. The third step you might not actually get to in the first few training sessions because it requires a couple of other skills to be taught to the puppy. One, either that the puppy can look away from treats that you're holding, like that, good, or that your puppy can offer you eye contact or at least look up at you when you make a kissy noise or an attention noise, good, like that. And I did not know that he would do all that so perfectly, you're so clever. Okay, so after doing step two where you reach mark, good, and then feed, you can start to wait until your puppy offers you eye contact or doesn't look at the treats because you don't want your puppy to only think that handling is okay if he's looking at food because when the food becomes out of the picture, then suddenly you might get the mouthing and biting or overexcitement with handling again. Good. So you reach, touch your puppy calmly, and wait for your puppy to stop looking at the food or look up at your eyes. And if that doesn't happen within two to three seconds, you can make your attention noise or say your puppy's name if that's his cue to look at you. Good. Now, when I make my attention noise and my puppy doesn't look, I make a little blowing noise, like a breathing noise, like that. Good. And then I mark it and then go to feed a treat. You want to make sure when you mark your puppy for calm behaviors like handling that you don't race to get that treat into the picture because what you can create is a puppy that's getting excited about the treat coming. So you want to mark, 
pause and then feed the treat. Step four, keep changing the picture. Practice these handling exercises while the puppy is sitting, standing, laying down, as well as while you're standing above the puppy or to the side of the puppy. It's really important that during this training you handle your puppy calmly. However, you should do some training sessions where you simulate what other people might do to your puppy before you can tell the person that that's not an appropriate way to pet a puppy. Good. If your puppy opens his mouth, gets excited, leans away or backs away, go back to step one where you touch and feed at the same time. If your puppy is still too excited, then stop training and wait until another time to train when he is calm. Here you can see my puppy ducks when I try to touch him on the head, so I go back to step one of touching and feeding at the same time. If you have a puppy that leans away or backs away from you when you try to touch him, you can play this game as the first step where you move away from your puppy and to reach the treat the puppy's face rubs against your hand to get the treat in your hand so you can hold your hand under his chin as he reaches for the treat or have your hand above his head then you can turn it into a petting gesture and start to pet him before you give him the treat Good. solving biting at clothing Today I'm going to be talking about how to teach your puppy not to mouth or bite at your clothing, accessories, or your hair. Good puppy. What I've already worked on with this pup, I've only had him a few days, is working on a calm settle for food, which he's doing right now so I can talk to you. Now, naturally, when I train dogs, I never want to let them rehearse the undesirable behavior. So, in my videos, you'll never see the dogs doing the things that they're not supposed to do. I only show you the small approximations of how to train the dog what you do want them to do. But in this case, because I get a lot of requests of people saying, hey, how come you're never using untrained dogs? It's because when you train with positive reinforcement, it always looks like the dog is already trained because you're breaking the steps up small enough that the dog can succeed every step of the way. So this puppy has never had any training with mouthing and biting, and I will show you that my puppy does mouth and bite at clothing when it moves around, but it's not very good training to do this. On this rare occasion, I will show the dog rehearsing the undesirable behavior. This is because the behavior of tugging is one I do want for when playing with tug toys in the future. Also, showing this specific undesirable behavior is not stressful for this dog. Seeing what the dog does in a situation before training actually makes the dog more likely to do those behaviors in the future. Instead, a smarter training plan is training in small, easily achievable steps where the dog doesn't even have a thought to do the undesirable behavior again. As you can see, this is a normal puppy. Puppies naturally want to grab at anything that moves fast or is dangling, like a dress or your hair or some jewelry or this dishcloth or a sweater sleeve as you're putting it on. So this is a normal puppy, but you'll see during the training, the puppy is not going to be doing this type of behavior. The point of this exercise is to teach the puppy that when things are dangling around, it means to ignore them, and you can still play tug with your dog, but it's really important to put that on a verbal cue like get it, and always say get it before you offer your dog a toy to tug on, so they don't get the wrong idea that anything that's dangling in their face is fair game to be tugged on. In this exercise, you can either use a clicker or a verbal marker. So you can either click and then feed a treat, or I have a nice calm marker, good. That means I'm gonna slowly deliver the treat to the puppy like that. The game is pretty simple. You start off with distractions that are very easy for the puppy to ignore. So with this sweater, for example, if the puppy's over here settling, or you could have your puppy on a leash and you could have a helper, the helper's just going to show the sweater and move it slowly, and as you move it, you mark and then feed a treat. So the puppy is associating that when the sweater moves and they stay still, they get a click and a treat. And basically you're training the puppy to do nothing when they see this happen. Good job. When your puppy is having success, you can start to make things more exciting. So I'm going to move the sweater past the puppy like this. 
Good. Good job. I'm going to dangle my sleeve. Good job. Good boy. Once your puppy has mastered settling with the distractions, you can now practice when you and your puppy are standing up and moving, which is harder for most puppies, so you'll need to go back to marking the moment the distraction happens at first to set your puppy up for success. Good. 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 Good job. Good. Good boy. Good job. When your puppy looks calm and can easily ignore the distraction, you can increase how long you make the distraction happen before you mark. You can also increase the difficulty of the distraction. Most puppies find fast, erratic movement harder to resist than slow, predictable movement. If you have a puppy that's extremely excited about grabbing moving things, you can feed the treat as you move the thing at first. So I'm moving this thing and feeding the puppy like that. Good job. And now I'm going to do the leash first and then mark and feed. Good. 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 If your puppy were to grab onto whatever it is that you're working with, put a high value treat to your dog's nose and then start over by making it much less arousing. Good. Also, I have a video on how to train the cue drop so that you can teach your puppy to let go of things that they start to pick up or they're tugging on. You can also use a kissy noise or the recall if you see your puppy going over to someone else to pull on their shoelaces or to get their clothing. You can make your kissy noise, attention noise, um, or call your puppy to you so that your puppy isn't practicing that behavior. When you see your puppy get interested in something, like someone's shuffling feet or shoelaces, interrupt your puppy and redirect him to something you do want him to be doing, like playing with his toys. Then make a mental note to work on that specific distraction in a training session. Here's a list of the steps. Step one, mark as the distraction happens. Step two, mark after the distraction begins. Step three, add more time before you mark. Step four, add difficulty and variety to the training. For the most successful training, you want to work on the distractions before the puppy is exposed to them in real life. For example, having your kids move in front of your puppy for the first time in a training session and reinforcing your puppy for remaining calm as it happens, beginning first by having the kids simply walking past your puppy. Leg biting. This video is on the topic of teaching your puppy not to bite your legs or clothing when you're walking around or moving around. And um, I will link a video in the description below on how to solve unwanted behaviors. So you can watch that if this doesn't make sense. But the important thing is teaching your puppy what you do want him to do. So if you notice that your puppy is going after your clothing uh, obsessively and it's one of the major problems you're having, I would focus on that as one of the major things that you work on from day one so that it doesn't become an annoying issue that is hard to get rid of. A lot of people ask, what should I do in the moment that it happens? Now, it's important not to let the behavior get re rehearsed in the moment that it's happening, but the really important thing is to train the puppy what to do. So when you notice that the puppy's going after your clothes and you say, oh, this keeps happening, I need to do something about it, then choose a moment, not at that moment, but when the puppy is calm to work on this behavior. If you try to train through the time when the dog is obsessed with your clothing, you're not going to have as much success as if you say, I need to jot this down and I need to work on it in a training session when the puppy is calm. So I'm using low value kibble. 
If you have a puppy that's super excited about kibble, I'm gonna show you two exercises. This one is with the puppy laying down in a settle, and I'll link a video in the description below on how to train a settle, but low value food will work very well for that. And then the second part of the exercise is where I'm moving and the puppy's moving. So if your puppy wasn't settling, you could work on that exercise um, first and then work on the settle uh, as a first step to this exercise. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to move and as I move, I'm gonna mark and reinforce the puppy by dropping a treat calmly between the puppy's paws. So at first it can be very calm, but later on I might move faster to, to give the puppy the treat. So I'm gonna change the camera angle in a second, but right now all I'm gonna do is stand up, mark the puppy, good, and then drop the treat. Now these, this scenario, these pants that I'm wearing, vet tech pants that I like to wear around the house and uh, in the mornings when I train my dogs, um, they're very flowy and he likes to go for those instead of my jeans. So one reason he's doing so good is that he's calm right now, but what I'm gonna do is take steps, good, and mark as I take the step, good, and feed a treat, good. So what I'm doing is reinforcing the absence of the behavior that I don't like and the behavior I do like is him being calm around the stimulus that I don't want him to go after my pants. So the wonderful thing about having the dog settling or sitting is that it's very obvious to see when they're too excited because they'll get up. So if the dog gets up, you need to slow down the training. You also don't want to make it more and more exciting. So if he's good with one step, then in two steps and three steps, then running around, um, you want to keep going back to where it's easy for the puppy so you don't mess up and the puppy gets overexcited. Good job. So I'm going to take a couple steps. Good. Jiggle the fabric a little bit. Good. Good. When the puppy's doing really well, you can make the distraction, wait a little bit, then mark and feed the treat or do the distraction for longer increments. So you might walk a step and mark as you make the first step, but then you may, might make a couple more steps before marking and reinforcing. To generalize the behavior, I'm gonna use a couple different materials that are more flowy um, and work on the same exercise with the pup. Now, if he started getting overexcited, I'm just gonna end the session and then work on it at another time. So first this shirt can simulate a dress. Good, because I'm not gonna wear a dress in this tutorial. I might get someone else to do that. Good. Good. Ooh. And the reason that my puppy is being so good is that I'm making the steps small enough so that he can succeed. I've chosen the correct reinforcement, which is the lower value kibble that he is enjoying. And um, I've chosen a time of day that he's pretty calm. So he's already enjoyed playing with my other dogs. He had a nap and now he's kind of just settled and interested enough in the food. Good. 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 This is enough for one training session and I'm gonna show you the next exercise in a little bit when I have some higher value treats and the puppies had a little break. But I'm also gonna increase criteria right now to show you what to do if the puppy does get up. So, you might have a helper that's a little over enthusiastic. Whoop, and there he gets up. So that was too much. And I'm just gonna lure him back into the down position and then go back to making it super easy for him like this. Good job, awesome. Whoop, good. Good. Yay, it's all finished. Come on, let's go outside. You need a break to go to the bathroom? Puppy. 
For this exercise, I like to use the clicker because the puppy is going to be moving with me and I can mark precisely that moment that the puppy's in the position next to my side and I can mark the puppy for moving with me. So I actually worked on this exercise for a minute or so yesterday. I've had the puppy for four days. Pop ups. And so to get the puppy in the position, I'm gonna drop a treat behind me. And as the puppy catches up, I'm gonna mark before he gets to me at first and then block him from getting ahead of me by feeding him the treat that he wants. So if your puppy was worried about being blocked like that, it probably means that he doesn't want the treat that you're giving him. Good job. So I'm gonna mark him moving with me and I'm also gonna mark him standing at my side. So not only are you working on teaching the puppy to walk at your side, but you're also reinforcing that puppy for not biting your pants as you're moving. So I like to use a coffee table or a chair and work first with the dog on the inside, marking and reinforcing for standing at your side, take a step forwards, mark and reinforce. If the puppy thinks to lay down, you can put a treat out ahead of him to get him up again. So he's looking for those treats. Good job. Then when the puppy's doing really well, you can increase how long you walk and you can also start hiding where the treat is so that your puppy isn't just staring up at the treats, but he's walking at your side um, and seeing your legs moving and you there. And that when he looks at that, that is he's finding it reinforcing to walk at your side without biting. Um, if you just have the treat there in the picture, the whole training session, you know, always, when there's no treat, he's gonna start biting your legs again. So it's really important to remove the treat from the picture. So he's already had one training session. That's why I can show you this next step. But the first step in the training session that I already did was just marking and reinforcing him for walking at my side like that. So now I can hide my hand behind my back and get that same behavior. Good boy. He almost thought to bite <laughs> the edge of the table, <laughs> didn't you? <laughs> okay, so that went really well. Now I can work on it with the leash attached to him because he also likes to bite at his leash. Now I'm gonna work on the same exercise, but with the leash attached to the puppy. So I've got the clicker and the leash in my right hand to have the puppy on my left side. And I'm gonna throw a treat back here, get it to lure the puppy back. And then as he catches up with me, I can mark and reinforce and play the same game. So by already doing the game, he's gonna be less likely to want to bite on the leash. Good job. And at first it can be very simple like this. And then later on, it can be more exaggerated where the leash is moving around more like this. Good, good boy. You can also practice having the puppy follow you where the leash is right in front of his face like that. Because at some point, maybe your puppy will pull and then you'll have to get your puppy back to you. And as you're getting your puppy back to you, the leash is gonna be right there in front of his face and he might be a little frustrated because he didn't get to go to say hi to the aggressive dog and he might bite at the leash. So he's just getting used to seeing the leash. I can also practice switching it over to the other side. Like that. Pop, pop, pop. Good boy, yeah. And I chose, as I said, I chose the correct time of day that he's not too overexcited by the food. Thank you so much for watching. If you'd like to support my work, don't forget to like this video and write a comment as that's really gonna help boost how many people see this information. You can also become a member of channel Kiko Pup by clicking the join button under any of my YouTube videos or on my YouTube channel, and that will gain you access to one extra video that you can find in the community section of my YouTube channel every month. See you later.